Hello and welcome to Bilateral Bites. I'm Tanya Spisbar, the Director of the Australia India Institute. And today we're fortunate enough to have with us Lisa Singh, a former federal politician from the Australian government, talking about politics, leadership and the environmental issues. Lisa Singh was formerly a government senator of Australia, serving in the parliament until 2019. Uh, she held a number of front bench roles, including Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Water. Lisa was also Minister for Assisting on Climate Change in her home state of Tasmania. Lisa, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So a number of parallels you will have noted have been drawn between COVID and climate change, and particularly the fact that countries have gone to unforeseen lengths uh, including lockdowns to flatten the curve on COVID-19 to save lives. Yet there hasn't been that same effort in climate change that we've been aware for the last few decades that um, similar efforts are required to save our planet. Do you think the government response to COVID-19 has impacted um, or given us learnings for how we might approach climate change? Well, that's a really good question. I think that... Um you know, if you asked anyone a month ago that, um, you know, factories would shut down and uh, international uh, travel would come to an end, uh, you know, and that that would lead to this slash in emissions that we've seen, that they would have been very shocked to hear that. But that's exactly what's happened. We've had this massive decrease in, in emissions across the globe because of a reduction in pollution from those closures and from those flights ending. I think the International Energy Agency has said that something like 2.6 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions, that will now no longer be in the atmosphere and that makes up something like 8% of our total uh, emissions reduction. Now, I think what we can learn from this is the fact that the makeup of most of um, the, the energy reduction that has occurred has been in coal, gas and oil. It hasn't been in renewables. In fact, renewables have remained stable, if not have increased during this time. So I think if there's a lesson here for governments to learn, it is in when it looks at its economic uh, stimulus uh, that it's providing to get the economy going, to ensure that climate change is part of that. And, it, and that means looking at renewables and looking at investments in renewables, because with this massive reduction in uh, the demand for oil, primarily, primarily obviously, through uh, international um, flights. Uh, we, I think the, the energy sector coming out of this pandemic is going to look very different from the one that we went into it for and renewables need to be front and centre as part of that. Yeah, I think those are, are all really good points. And I was struck as well that there was an 8% reduction in emissions um, targets as committed to in Paris, um, in the Paris Accord. Um, and you've also touched already on the Australian stimulus package, which is estimated to be about 10% of Australia's GDP, um, matching the United States. India is now um, said to have committed about 10%, and I think Singapore 12%. But each country has taken a, quite a different approach, it seems, to its financial stimulus of the economy. So, for example, South Korea and the European Union have each sought to do a green finance package. Um, which is what you're mentioning for Australia as well. Australia has focused very strongly on jobs and skills. Do you think that there is um, an opportunity in Australia for green finance and investment in, say, um, sustainable and resilient infrastructure alongside renewable energy that could also lead to green jobs and a green economy, not just climate emissions? Well, I think that's the opportunity before us as, as, as Australians, as, as a country, mm -hmm. is to recognise the overlap that's, that's there between the downturn in the economy and climate change. I think if both of those come together through investment in renewables, for example, uh, and looking at sustainable infrastructure, I mean, there's a range of areas where uh, Australia could invest when we talk about uh, mm -hmm. a, a sort of more clean energy future but there needs to first be that commitment given by by government and it, that needs to be some sort of policy framework so that investment will come forward and at the moment I don't think that's there uh, I think uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia has shown that there's actually been a, a downturn in investment in renewable energy so 
if, if we are going to see some sort of um, approach to green finance, to sustainable infrastructure, to all of the things that will modernise our economy and help produce thousands of jobs, which is the, the great part about moving into that, that clean energy economy, then we need the policy settings from government to be there in the first place, which means government needs to put renewable energy ahead of non-renewable energy. And uh, mm. I, I really hope that happens. I, I really do, because that could be indeed the silver lining out of this pandemic. I mean, we know the terrible impact this has had on thousands of jobs in Australia and indeed across the globe. So we need to look now at how we can stimulate our, our economy to create those jobs. And, of course, skills are an important part of that. Sure. But they could be, that could be skills in the renewable energy sector. I mean, I think there are a number of um, um, projects in solar and wind in Australia that have already had planning uh, approval that are, that are ready to go, but they, they need the right regulatory framework to make that happen. I don't think the renewable energy sector is necessarily allow, uh, asking for subsidies. It's asking mm. for um, the right regulatory framework, the right policy settings from government. I think that's, that's a definite way that Australia could move forward out of this. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting time to have this discussion, isn't it? Because we've already had disruption in, in the energy markets um, and energy use. Mm -hmm. um, then you, you turn to the fact that Australia is quite a sun-rich country itself, um, can harness wind. And I guess it's also about backing Australia's talent. So, you know, Australia, I think, has been quite active in renewable energy research. And University of New South Wales, for example, has been um, one of the longest contributors to solar panel research. I think I saw something that said that, you know, the top 10 CEOs in China that export solar cells actually were all graduates of UNSW, which just shows um, that if we could harness yeah. our own talent, um, <clears throat> well, Australia might yeah, be doing yeah. that work. That's a great example. And, and I'm speaking here today from, from the little state of Tasmania, which again has been a, a real renewable energy hub for the country in exporting our uh, wind and our hydro energy to the rest of the nation. And now we're looking at seeing how we can develop green hydrogen, which is another area of, um, of clean, tech, clean energy that we can move into. I think it's clear, though, that this has to be part of our future because this is what we need to jumpstart the economy. But it's also reflecting on the fact that coal, gas and oil have all been in decline. And I think those short-term projects that only look at those sorts of energy, sec energy sources is, is not what we need. And I think that's, that sort of short-sightedness is certainly something we don't need now. We, we do need the, the, the bigger picture, the long-term impact that's going to create thousands of jobs for, for now, but also for years ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> no, it makes a really good a, a really good point domestically for jobs, for economy, for energy use, for smart energy use, and for underwriting Australia's talent. Thinking now about international foreign policy opportunities, I know that you've been a strong advocate throughout your political career, Lisa, for improving Australia's relationship with India at all levels. Um, Australia was also an early uh, signer onto the International Solar Alliance, which is based in India and one of um, Prime Minister Modi's legacies now, creating an international organisation in India. Um, do you see a role perhaps in Australia's forward foreign policy in driving an environmental agenda being good for its international relations? Well, look, I think so. I think it definitely should be in the mix. Um, I mean, India has been quite out there at the forefront of ensuring solar and you know renewables is part of its energy mix going forward not just relying on on coal you know and as, as it has you know as well but I think you know I think when we look at Australia and, and indeed our region in terms of uh, whether it's um, pushing for for more you know cleaner options um, environmentally in terms of energy or or other ways we build our, our relationship in this region I think we have to acknowledge that out of this pandemic, there needs to be a new, some sort of new form of globalisation and that mm. what we've been doing in the past just, just cannot go on into the future. The sort of 
profits before people, if I can call it, you know, way of operating is, is just not something that is sustainable. I think we, we have to recognise the fact that during this time, uh, New Delhi has seen blue skies. <laughs> and I've seen the pictures, I'm sure you have as well. Um, yeah. You know, we can't go back to, to the old way of doing things. We need to find new ways. Now, part of that has to be in reducing pollution. And I think the, the way to, to do that is to, as you talked about research and sharing our expertise, sharing our talents and indeed opening up those sorts of trade relationships on those environmental uh, sustainable footings. So, yeah, renewable energy, definitely part of that. I know that Hydro Tasmania here has been supporting um, uh, India and Nepal and uh, a number of countries in the region on time in terms of renewables. So I think that can, can build. But likewise, we can learn from what India has been doing because it's been doing a, a very broad-based um, expansion of, of solar um, uh, for some time. So I think more collaboration in terms of these shared values that we have about reducing our carbon emissions, um, living in a more globally healthy, secure world, uh, are, are good good aspects that we can use for our relationship going forward. Yeah, no, I, I really think those are very good points, particularly with, um, with India and its economic relationship. Obviously, we had the Australian government-led um, India economic strategy produced, and India is intending to respond with the you know, Australia economic strategy as India sees it. And certainly some of Australia's resources like cobalt are seen to be underwriting um, India's potential in battery storage for electric vehicles and other forms of, other forms of energy. Um, and certainly the work that Tasmania is doing in hydro to support um, energy elsewhere too just sounds fantastic. One thing I wanted to um, draw out from you though is your your concept of new globalism and um, the fact that we need to do things a bit differently. Prime Minister Modi has been saying exactly that. And uh, while many countries are looking at this time as a time for nation building <clears throat> and potentially national focus economically, Prime Minister Modi has come out and spoken about a human centric new multilateralism that will be necessary to engage in going forward. <clears throat> this has been supported by by France um, through Macron, Merkel in Germany, um, and certainly others in the United Nations um, as, as spearheading a new multilateralism. Do you think there's a place in Australia to have a discussion about human-centric social consciousness alongside our economic growth? And could we bring that sense of international kindness and responsibility into our Australian domestic politics, do you think? Well, I think, again, out of this pandemic, what's come clear is that we we can work collectively um, you know we've mm. had a global health crisis that has has brought us together to work collectively on how to how to you know combat this this virus and I did remark on some of those comments I was pleased to hear them from um, Prime Minister Modi and and indeed from Macron and and some other world leaders in terms of you know a new sort of working together i think i think it's needed i think it's needed now more than ever to to strengthen multilateralism not not to not to kill it so to speak but how we do that is is going to be the challenge and i think working collectively recognizing that we are one humanity uh for australia recognizing our place in the region and working within our region and building bridges with our neighbors i know that australia has been doing that with the Pacific, but I think that could be strengthened in particularly mm. in terms of climate change as well, because the Pacific Island nations are very threatened by climate change. And I think that, you know, in doing that, we, we can start to ensure that we are living up to those social norms and principles that we've signed up to in some of those um, international treaties and that, you know, that play out in those multilateral fora. But I think really for any sort of new globalisation to work or, um, you know, new sort of multilateral uh, order to work, we need to, well, for Australia at least and, and others, to commit to reducing poverty because, mm. you know, it's, it's one thing to, to sort of address the economic downturn that's come out of this pandemic. For example, in Australia, we've had 
for over 20 years now um, a terribly low uh, welfare payment for the unemployed. Now, that has been doubled under this pandemic, uh, but it's only for the life of the pandemic or, you know, for the next six months mm. thereabouts. There's been a strong push for that welfare payment to not go back to, to the level it was. Now, that is because of the fact that a number of people are living in poverty and unless we address the, this issue of poverty at, that has come about through globalisation, I think, we've got some ridiculous number of, of, of you know, individuals living in extreme wealth and, and then that huge disparity with, with those in poverty. So I, I just think that needs to be at the heart when we talk about this sort of new new way of cooperating to ensure that the economic benefits are shared by all and not just by those uh, few at the top and then some of those further down. Yeah, I think that's a really, honestly, it's, it's one of the most um, profound observations, I think, that this pandemic has brought about. Not only um, where we are in terms of new multilateralism and how countries are engaging, obviously we've seen countries like the United States um, directly attack international organisations like the World Health Organisation and we've seen others rush to defend and strengthen these institutions to ensure collaboration and what we can see at an international level is that you know security, health security, any kind of security really requires cooperation but the point you've just made domestically as well is that it's highlighted the need to look at our health education and welfare structures domestically as we strive for GDP growth, if we don't look at it on a per capita basis and then make that per capita a reality in terms of how we look at microeconomic reforms for distribution, we are in fact left incapable. And I think this was one of the things that they realised in the United States as well, where if health, education and welfare isn't able to be accessed by all, um, you really end up with a social infrastructure that is not capable to withstand disaster. And similarly, I think India has seen that with its migrant worker population as well. So the yeah. positives of this is that even though we've, we've got very vulnerable populations, the vulnerable have been made visible. And the hope mm -hmm. is that you can't unknow what you now know. So once That's we have seen true. these dilemmas, um, it's hard to act with credibility once we know the problems we have if we don't then address them. Yeah, I was going to touch on the migrant workers in um, mm. in India as another part of that. Um, I think that in terms of of talking about strengthening, you know, our nations domestically, but also our cooperation between each other, that we have to ensure that um, we are we are speaking what we preach, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. Um, uh, you know, we are living what we preach, at least, in, in some of the policy settings that we make. And um, it's definitely been very visible, I think, during this pandemic, how there are a number of people that have fallen through the cracks that do need government to be there, um, ensuring that, that, that they're supported. And I think for India, that's something that, um, that they've taken quite seriously as well, as it becomes very, very visible, just how how many in their population. I mean, it's very difficult to estimate because much of the workers are in the informal sector, uh, but yeah. some were estimating as much as 300 million at times in their lives are in, migrant, um, in a migrant worker situation. And certainly part of India's 10% stimulus has been aimed at um, addressing some of the food shortages and critical conditions that the workers were, were faced in. Um, but honestly, that's been a really interesting discussion Lisa there's so much so many angles to the COVID crisis but now hopefully as we move through it and address what we can learn from it and how we can become more resilient as societies as nations and globally um, I hope there are lots of lessons for leadership to draw from this to improve our society going forward so thank you very much given your your very rich experience in australian politics your perspectives have been very valuable as well and um we hope we can engage with you again very soon in the future thank you so much i've really enjoyed it tanya